after this uh, short break. Uh, so I see that um, uh, Salma started uh, the recording. So <clears throat> we are uh, happy to give you the floor, Vincent, to learn more about how to, to make a uh, camera uh, more um, calibrated tools. Yeah. You see my uh, presentation properly? Yeah. You properly. Thank you. You hear me loud and clear? Yes. Right. right. Like if you were in Angers, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Ah. <laughs> in Feneu. So uh, thanks, thanks to David Rousseau to have uh, invited me for this uh, workshop. And so effectively, I will talk about camera calibration or how to use a camera as a measurement tool. So first, uh, who am I? I'm a researcher, physicist in uh, optics in the lighting team uh, in CEREMA. So I already said, but CEREMA is an institute which uh, historically was dedicated to roads and bridges. And nowadays it uh, deals with uh, infrastructures and also environment, transport and uh, mobility. And so my team is interested in uh, road lighting, tunnel lighting, and uh, some examples stand uh, uh, here, uh, just above my head, and where you can see a road and its luminance image here um, in, in false color. And uh, luminance is uh, a physical quantity your A is uh, sensitive to. Um, next to it, an example in a tunnel. And uh, in our lab, we own an optical um, metrological um, room with um, an integrating sphere, with uh, monochromators, spectrometers, and so on, in order to calibrate our optical systems. So indeed, we um, customize cameras to um, fit the human eye sensitivity. And after calibration, we use them to measure luminance. So to measure what uh, the human eye is seeing. We also developed a system with a high dynamic range based on four synchronous cameras here to obtain the same dynamic or almost the same dynamic as the human eye. And so I will talk about um, calibration, but uh, again, I'm not expert with uh, plants or phenotyping. So I should apologize now. My examples uh, will be often related to uh, roads application, but we will see that uh, it can be uh, applied in uh, many domains. So why do we need camera calibration? for many reasons. Uh, first, use cameras as measurement tools, as my uh, subtitle says, but also to obtain meaningful data from cameras. We have many systems, um, reflex cameras, uh, industrial cameras, smartphone also, um, even Raspberry Pi cameras, and all these systems uh, could measure the same thing. And so we need to have common data from these uh, hete heterogeneous uh, camera systems. So uh, this is the outlook of my presentation. First, I'm going to recall some uh, basics on uh, cameras. Um, sorry in advance for those uh, who already knows it. And then we will see uh, how to have a model of a camera in order to calibrate and how to measure distances in images. It will be related to uh, geometric calibration. Uh, secondly, we will talk about how to quantify light intensity. Thus, I will explain how to carry out a photometric calibration. And at last, we will address um, color measurements and how to conduct a colorimetric calibration. So 
camera basics let's go uh, inside a camera what are the camera parameters you have to look at when you take a shot well, i'm going to explain uh, each um, parameter hereafter but uh, the first one is uh, focal length uh, which is generally fixed it uh, adjusts the zoom level second is the aperture it sets the quantity of light entering the camera third the shutter speed which is also called um, integration time or uh, exposure time and uh, finally iso uh, also called gain which adjusts uh, the light sensitivity of the sensor so for the first one camera uh, focal lens it's uh, the distance typically in millimeter over which initially collimated rays are brought in focus as it's here it's a feature of the camera's lens so it's not really inside the camera here we are rather outside but uh, it's one of the parameters of the image and focal lens acts on the field of view f o v uh, or again the zoom effect through the relation with the act tangent here d over 2f or we, where uh, d is uh, the diagonal of your sensor so in practice um, this is it uh, a short focal length uh, leads to a wide angle of view so uh, it can be used for uh, landscape for example and at the contrary uh, on the bottom right here a longer focal length allows to zoom in so this is for the first parameter the second is the aperture it corresponds to the diameter of the entrance pupil uh, which is defined by the f number the f number is the ratio of f the focal length on the diameter of the entrance pupil this f number is um, um, belongs to a, a standard list of values uh, as you can see here 1.4 2 2.8 and so on and uh, larger the uh, f number and smaller the entrance pupil again in practice uh, this f number uh, is uh, also a lens parameter and it uh, acts obviously on the quantity of light entering the camera but also on the depth of field also called depth of focus um, as the examples show here so in the top picture um, the aperture is small, so corresponding to a great F number. Um, the focus is here on the uh, horse head, and the depth of focus is large, as you can read the time here on the clock. But when you open the diaphragm, you reduce the depth of focus, the depth of field, and for the focus object, it doesn't change anything but you can no longer read the time so you have decreased the depth of field um, this is for the aperture the third parameter is shutter speed so it's more uh, obvious it's a real camera parameter this time the shutter speed or exposure time or integration time is the length of time the shutter is open so uh, it is directly proportional to the amount of light entering the camera and uh, it is related to motion blur uh, the pictures present here different shutter speeds a long uh, exposure time here one quarter of a second uh, implies a motion blur of the fan 
we can see here. Uh, a shorter shutter speed, one thousandth of a second, suppresses the blur because the fan moved a little during the exposure time. So for this three picture, the quantity of light uh, seems to be the same, but the F number has been changed to compensate the exposure time. So here, uh, shorter uh, the exposure time and greater the aperture. So this is for the uh, third parameter. And finally, the ISO, also called gain, the uh, organ film speed it is a, um, a measurement of the sensitivity uh, of a sensor or a film to the light. So lower uh, ISO values, uh, it begins at 100 or 200 depending on the systems. Uh, so high ISO generates uh, less noise but requires more light or more uh, integration time, as we can see uh, here on the left side uh, images. And on the other hand, uh, higher ISO values lead to more noise, um, and but requires uh, less light corresponding to uh, the right side images. So now that we know uh, how a camera is working or what are the uh, main parameters, we need um, a little bit of, of optics, uh, sorry for that, to introduce uh, geometric calibration. But first, some example, why do we need and what uh, allows geometric calibration? Uh, it permits to estimate some parameters of the lens, of the sensor of a camera, and you can use these parameters to correct images, for example, for lens distortion here, or to estimate depth uh, using two cameras. You can also measure the size of an object in uh, world units, and we will uh, um, focus uh, on that subject uh, later on. Uh, or you can also reconstruct uh, 3D models. So these different tasks are used in uh, applications such as uh, um, machine vision to detect, to measure objects. They are also used in uh, robotics for navigation systems uh, and also for 3D uh, reconstruction. So a basic uh, uh, camera model is a pinhole camera. It's a, a simple camera without a lens and with a single small aperture here. Um, it projects an inverted image on the opposite side of the camera and a vision uh, sensor can be modeled by a pinhole camera and it's fully described by the, uh, by the following parameters. It's focal length expressed in millimeter or sometimes in pixels. The pixel size of the uh, photosensitive matrix, again in millimeter or in pixel by millimeter. And U0, V0, uh, which are the optical center coordinates, also in pixels. So a vision uh, uh, sensor can be uh, fully described by these uh, one, two, three, four parameters. So the question is now, how do we uh, determine these parameters? A uh, little bit more uh, optics or um, mathematics. Uh, we need a mathematical model. So a vision sensor can be modeled by two uh, successive mathematical transformation. First, an optical coupling between the object and the image, A, B, and A prime, B prime. And second, an integration and sampling by the uh, photosensitive matrix. The first um, uh, effect, so the optical coupling, 
is represented by a linear operator matrix. How does it work? So um, uh, an object point here, uh, capital M, in the world, so in the unit world, um, with a uh, grid uh, X, Y, and Z, is projected uh, through the lens uh, in the sensor plane here with uh, two coordinates, uh, X and Y uh, in lowercase, and it couples the world units to the imaged units with the Thales uh, relation, in French, Thales. I, I'm not be sure of my pr uh, pronunciation. So, so it includes the uh, focal lens here, and we can model the optical coupling by a simple matrix given here uh, with the world unit here and image unit here. Quite simple. So it's for the uh, first effect, the optical coupling, and second, you uh, integrate and sample, uh, and it can be also represented by uh, a matrix with uh, point coordinates are expressed in pixels and defined from image top left, that it, uh, it's quasi classical in, uh, in image processing. So U0, V0 are the coordinates of the optical center, and here alpha u, alpha v uh, are the size of uh, the pixels. And again, this second transformation, the spatial sampling, uh, can be represented by a simple matrix here, uh, where it transforms image units here in uh, millimeters or in meters into coordinates in pixels. So we have two matrix representing a projection and a sampling. So we can combine these two transformation and we obtain an operator for a vision sensor. This operator is the matrix K, which appears here. Uh, and it can be uh, combined with the, the both uh, previous transformation, and you have this quite simple matrix where U0, V0 are the center coordinates, and FU, FV um, are equivalent focal lengths with the previous uh, parameters, the focal length in millimeter, and the size of the pixels also in millimeters. So these uh, K matrix of K parameters are called camera intrinsic parameters. And they are sufficient to describe the wall sensor and can be measured by geometric calibrations. That's what uh, we will see. So it describes the uh, camera and its parameters, but to describe the camera position in the world with respect to some object, uh, we need a more global uh, transformation uh, described by the camera matrix. And this is it. This matrix, it's a P matrix, uh, maps the 3D world scene into the image plane and P can be decomposed into two uh, matrix. The intrinsic parameters we have just seen with the uh, optical center, pixel size, uh, focal length of the camera. And a new one, the extrinsic parameters, um, which represent the location of the camera in the 3D scene. And this uh, Extrinsic, uh, extrinsic parameters consist of a rotation R and a translation T. And the origin of the camera's coordinate system uh, is at its optical center here. And uh, it's Y, uh, um, X and, sorry, X and Y axis define the image plane.
and uh, another explanation here in this scheme uh, camera is here with its frame here um, here the uh, image plane or image frame and here the world frame and the world points here from a leaf for example uh, these points are transformed to camera coordinates using the extrinsic parameters so a rotation and a translation and then the camera coordinates are mapped into the image plane using the intrinsic parameters. So, last mathematics uh, slide. This uh, intrinsic uh, uh, parameters represent a rigid transformation from 3D world coordinate system to 3D cameras coordinate system and the intrinsic parameters represent a projective transformation for the 3D cameras coordinate into the two-dimensional uh, image coordinates. So we have the basics. Well, now uh, we can add a little more thing. It's distortion because as I said before the pinhole camera doesn't um, have a lens, but the lens it's uh, an important uh, optical uh, instrument, but it has some default and in our model the camera matrix does not account for lens distortion because it's a, an ideal pinhole camera. And so to accurately represent a real camera our model or camera model should include uh, a radial and a tangential uh, lens distortion. So we can see some example of distortion here. In the world, this is straight line, but in image, uh, you can observe some curves here. So what is a radial distortion? Uh, it occurs when light, light rays, bend more near the edges of the lens than they do at its optical center. So the smaller the lens, the greater the distortion. So it can be uh, expressed by this equation. X and Y here are uh, undistorted pixel locations. They are in uh, normalized, uh, uh, normalized uh, image coordinates. So, okay, uh, K1, K2, and K3 are the uh, radial distortion coefficients of the lens we have to determine. And uh, R2 here is an uh, expression of uh, X uh, power 2 plus uh, Y power 2. So, typically, uh, Two coefficients uh, are sufficient for calibration, for negative or positive uh, distortion. But for a severe distortion, such as in um, uh, wide uh, angle lenses, you can select uh, sometimes three coefficients and uh, include K3. Uh, so this is for the radial distortion and uh, last one, it's tangential uh, distortion. It occurs where, uh, when the lens and the image plane are not really uh, parallel. So again, it can be described by more um, complex uh, equations, but we have just to retain that it can also be described only by two parameters, P1 and P2. So, now that we have a, a complete model with many parameters, we have to estimate them. How do we do that in practice? Uh, so, we have the theoretical background and let's go to a practical case and derivate um, completely a geometric calibration. So, from images, we will uh, we want to uh, estimate all the previous parameters 
focal lengths, um, U0, V0 optical centers, um, pixel size, uh, so the intrinsic uh, parameters. We want to estimate K1, uh, K2, uh, P1, P2 for distortions. And we want also to estimate a rotation vector and a translation uh, vector. So we have many, many parameters, so many unknowns. And so we need many equations. So many equations, which will be represented by many points in the world frame and their corresponding points in the camera frames. Thus, we need this uh, tool. It's a checkerboard with squares on a planar surface, surface and uh, the dimensions of the squares are known. Uh, this checkerboard should be positioned in all parts of the field of view. Uh, have enough variation in orientation with respect to the camera. The angle should be lower than uh, 45 degrees relative to the camera plane to have a good detection here of the squares. And you should capture dozens of pictures to have uh, many, many points, many key points. And the images or pictures uh, should be saved as uncompressed file to, to keep um, the uh, edges uh, sharp. So in uh, T for BMP or PNG, uh, whatever. And the final tool is a, a calibration library often based on a Zong uh, method which um, estimate these previous parameters from different key points on your checkerboard. I can zoom in, I think. Yes. So the pattern in the uh, images, oh, sorry, um, must be in different 3D orientation and uh, the important uh, thing is that you have key points in all parts of the field of view. In particular, it's um, very um, uh, important to have key points close to the edges and the corner uh, here of your uh, image in order to um, uh, get a better uh, estimate of the distortion coefficients. So here what we see, uh, green circles represent uh, automated uh, detected points and their coordinates in the camera frame. And as you know the square's uh, dimensions, each uh, point is related to a world point. And then we can obtain as many equations as detected points. So parameters can be uh, estimated uh, just solving this uh, uh, linear system of equations. And so after a click on calibrate, uh, you can obtain this kind of results uh, where we have uh, uh, the intrinsics, so the focal length expressed in pixels. So it, it, uh, there is an X uh, value and a Y value. Uh, also principal points, so the optical center. Uh, here I choose only two coefficients uh, for radial distortion. And it calculates also extrinsics for each uh, image. So here, uh, one, two, three, four images here. And for each image, you have a rotation vector and a translation vector. So um, thanks to this uh, result, we can now uh, have a complete model of our camera because we know all the parameters which describe uh, the sensor, uh, the vision sensor. And so we can reproject each 
point from world coordinates to image coordinates. So uh, they are represented by uh, red crosses. I, I will zoom in. Yes. Um, so uh, the red crosses uh, are the reprojection uh, of our model. Uh, and the green circles are the real positions in the image. So the difference uh, are called reprojection errors. And you can calculate it. This is it. Uh, a reprojection error is the distance between uh, a pattern key point detected in a calibration image, so a green circle, and a corresponding world point projected with the model into the same image. So uh, reprojection errors provide a um, qualitative measure of accuracy. So here we have different images, and we can see that the uh, biggest error is 1.02 pixels, so it's quite good. And the uh, average error is 0 0.66 pixels, so it, it's quite good. Um, Second uh, possibility, you can also um, measure or um, retrieve um, the pattern position here with respect to the camera. So it means that for each uh, image, the algorithm uh, estimates extrinsic uh, parameters. And so we can use this uh, rotation and translation to um, retrieve the position of a point in the world units. So it will be very uh, useful to measure uh, objects in uh, a plane. And that is what we are going to see now. Um, this is it. So one application of geometric uh, calibration is to measure uh, objects. Um, so here, uh, we try to measure the size of planar objects, such as, as coins. We can see here, there are a little uh, here. So they were uh, tapped uh, on the board. So uh, this image includes the calibration pattern, and the pattern is in the same plane as the object you want to measure. So you need some uh, hypotheses. The first step is to remove lens distortion from the image. And uh, we can see here, there is a clue. You can see here some uh, black areas, which show you that this is an undistorted uh, image. So uh, with that, uh, lines in the world are, are now lines uh, also in the image. And I can also zoom in uh, the coins. And so this is absolutely necessary for accurate measurement to undistort uh, your, your, your image before to try to measure a distance uh, uh, in the image. So now that we have an undistorted image, we know um, extrinsic, uh, intrinsic parameters. So we can apply some uh, geometric calculation to uh, measure distance uh, in image. So the first thing is to detect these two coins. So it's uh, a basic uh, uh, image processing. We can use the uh, objects properties to segment uh, them out. Here, the coins uh, can be automatically detected thanks to their uh, rune shape, for example. And you can add a bounding box to say it's, yeah, it's a uh, Two, two euros a coin. And to measure um, the coin, we convert the top left and top right corners of the bounding box 
into world coordinates thanks to the rotation and the translation vector associated to this uh, image. And then we can compute the uh, Euclidean distance between them in millimeters. So uh, you can note that the actual diameter of a two euros coin is uh, 25.75 millimeters. And we can measure, so the first uh, result is 26.5 millimeter, and for the second coin is 27.06. So we, are, we have, yes, 5% uh, of difference. It's quite good if we remember that uh, it, there were very, very little pixels here in the wall image. So you can uh, have more accurate uh, measurement if uh, you uh, image your uh, object with uh, many pixels. So in addition, you can also uh, measuring um, uh, how far away it is from the camera because you know all the system. And so we found that uh, the distance from the camera to the first coin was about 1.8 meter. All right. So it's a quite simple uh, example uh, of um, uh, measuring uh, objects, but in real life, uh, you can't capture a checkerboard every time, or you need to measure uh, distances uh, out of plane. Uh, I, uh, sorry for the French comments uh, in the image. Here it's a um, uh, vanishing point and vanishing line and the point here we want to measure and some uh, parameters of uh, aperture. Uh, anyway, so um, after having uh, undistorted our images, we should assume a flat world uh, as the Earth is, because uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, the Earth is flat. Yeah, no, um, I'm kidding. But uh, so some people uh, still believe it. It's it's incredible. But uh, anyway, um, we assume a flat world to to uh, compute uh, some distances in image. And Mr. Uh, Fails is again helpful here. Uh, given the height uh, of the camera and its view angle, we can um, calculate a distance in the world by a pixel line. And uh, we can uh, derive, for example, a grid position in the world uh, thanks to some normative uh, standards. Um, but I, yeah, I, uh, so we can do measurements here from monocular uh, camera, but uh, I should mention that it's quite better to use a stereo, stereoscopic uh, system with two cameras if you want to do uh, a 3D uh, measurement. Uh, so for, for two cameras, the calibration process is absolutely the same. Uh, you calculate intrinsic parameters for each camera, then extrinsic for each camera, and you can deduce uh, a transformation to map a picture from one camera to another, uh, and then uh, you can rectify uh, the image and to be able to match uh, similar pixels, and finally to obtain a depth map and very accurate uh, measurement in 3D. Um, so, and it's quite yeah much more accurate than uh, that, that mono monocular uh, imagery. So this is it. Yes, I'm done for the um, uh, geometric uh, calibration and it's time to measure light if my mouse is no a common maybe like that yes 
Because often we want to measure distances, as we have seen, but also in the same time, uh, we want to measure light intensity. Uh, like in that uh, example, where we are interested in glare, in the blooming uh, effect. Uh, sometimes we want to measure uh, source intensity or uh, in this example, we want to know the source intensity and in the same time how it reflects on the road surface before to reach uh, or A. So to do that, um, we need again, and I'm sorry, some theoretical basics uh, first in uh, photometry. So, um, photometry is a part of the uh, electromagnetic wave study, which deals only with visible light, corresponding to 380 nanometers to 780 nanometers. A source handle, uh, uh, here a candle, sorry, uh, emits a flux in lumen in all direction and it uh, emits an intensity in a solid angle, in units of candela. The light falls onto a surface and it is called the illuminance, measured in lux. And finally, the surface reflects light to or A and the unit is the candela per square meter and it is called the luminance. You can just retain this letter unit because it is the magnitude of your A is sensitive to. So your retina transmits a signal proportional to the luminance. Uh, on the other hand, cameras are also sensitive to luminances, but their responses are quantified in gray levels, gray levels here. Then to use a camera as a light intensity measuring tool, we need to know the relation which transform gray level in uh, luminance or uh, um, in unit of uh, a pixel value into uh, luminance that is uh, candela per square meter. And this uh, um, relation, or to find this relation, is the photometric calibration. So now we uh, need uh, to come back to the camera. How it works, it's made of uh, millions of uh, photodiodes. Their signal is proportional to light, depending on many parameters, active area, wavelengths, and quantum efficiency, and so on. But uh, the camera signal, so the gray level, is function of the four, uh, four previous parameters, camera parameters, shutter speed, gain, and lens parameters, focal lens, and aperture uh, called F number. So the photometric calibration will also depend on these four parameters. Um, how is born a gray level? Uh, the luminance here is coming from a scene, a landscape, passing through the lens here. It gives rise by a linear optics to an illuminance E that falls onto the sensor surface. The camera electronics transform, uh, transforms uh, light energy into electrical charge charges, so uh, transform photons in, uh, into electrons, and then an amplification, an analog to digital conversion and a quantization lead to a pixel value or gray level. And at this step, we obtain a so-called raw image, 
uh, where the signal is still linear with the luminance. So all is fine. But many steps are then required to produce the final image, uh, JPEG image, for example. And these steps are demosaicing, I will explain later, white balancing, gamma correction, and so on. And some of these transformations are non-linear. And so the resulting uh, RGB uh, or gray level value here is no more linear with the entrance luminance. So first, we will assume that uh, uh, we have access to the raw image. So assuming that all the parameters I fixed, uh, focal lens, uh, shutter speed, and so on, and the calibration consists in recording many gray levels for many luminances. So to measure this, uh, uh, this point. The theory says that it exists an affine relation between raw signal and luminance. So the question is now, uh, how do we change the luminance? And uh, yes, Emmanuel, the non linearity on JPEG is very uh, important. Yes, we can come back on that. Um, so the question is, how do we change the luminance and uh, uh, how do we know it? So, if you're rich, the uh, uh, expensive way is to have an integrating sphere where you can change and adjust finally the entrance luminance. Uh, you can do that. We, uh, if you do that, so we we observe first. Uh, little signal here called a dark noise uh, that is a signal even if the camera in is plunged in the dark so th this signal is uh, related to thermal and electronic noises and at the other side we can observe here a saturation when um, the electrical charges can no longer be uh, stored. But between these two values, we can define uh, a linear range. And that is in this part that we will do uh, our measurement or light measurement. So some examples, this is uh, a dark image, very noisy, uh, just for, for the presentation. Here, the gain uh, was fixed at a very high value, so it explains uh, uh, why you see this uh, uh, salt and uh, paper uh, appearance. Um, higher the gain, uh, higher the noise. So to have uh, a accurate measurement of uh, light quantity, it's preferable to work at very low uh, gain, if possible. Um, a second default uh, is observed when the input luminance is constant and homogeneous, we should observe an homogeneous and constant image. But as you can see here, it's not the case. We can see that there is more energy on the optical center than on the edges. Uh, if we do a profile, a profile along here, a profile along the dotted line uh, is plotted here, and we can see that it's not a constant. Uh, this is due to the uh, finite extent of the lens, and so it's uh, an optical effect and not an electronic one. So uh, a flat field uh, image can be uh, recorded or generated from the integrating sphere. But uh, if you're not rich, you can also do it with a white paper or also a white screen. 
uh, your screen with a, a, a blank uh, image. So uh, dark and flat field uh, defaults should be corrected uh, before to measure uh, light intensity. So how do we do that? Uh, the corrected signal or the corrected image, if we talk about uh, image, uh, can be constructed uh, in subtracting uh, the dark image and dividing by the flat field image. Then the function is affine or almost. And here, uh, all parameters are fixed. Shutter speed is at uh, T1 gain fixed, focal length f number fixed, and we can define a range of linearity here between the two uh, blue lines. You can see here saturation. And we observe that we can do measurement until here, that is, I don't know, uh, about 100 candela per square meter. So if I want to measure more luminosity, I should adjust shutter speed, uh, decreasing integration time. So we can do that with T2, that is smaller than T1, and we obtain a second uh, calibration curve or calibration line. Um, and you can measure more luminosity. And if you want more, you can decrease again the shutter speed and again and here with uh, four integration times we can measure a luminance range from uh, approximately 0 0.1 to 10 power 5 that is six orders of magnitude it's not um, not uh, the wall uh, a dynamics, but it's quite good. So this technique to uh, take some images at different shutter times is called HDR for high dynamic range imaging. So this is an example of three pictures with the uh, same scene um, taken with three different integration times and we can uh, select all the pixels in each image um, being in the linear range and combine them to obtain a single uh, HDR uh, image. Uh, exactly as your smartphone uh, uh, works in HDR mode. It takes three images and combine uh, the good pixels, the well uh, exposed pixels. Uh, and show you only one uh, beautiful uh, image. Uh, so uh, this uh, kind of uh, technique works very fine uh, in static. Uh, that is, if uh, nothing moves uh, in the scene, or uh, if the camera do not move, does not move uh, also. But it uh, doesn't work anymore if something uh, moves. And if you are uh, uh, embedded in a car as or applications, it's not the solution. There is um, some other technique to, to do that, but uh, I will not uh, discuss here. But uh, we talk about a low cost uh, image, so we uh, you are not. Uh, um, uh, uh, you have not integrating sphere or some uh, calibrating device. So, how do we do if we uh, don't have access to the raw image, and uh, if we don't have an integrating sphere, can we, uh, despite all, calibrate our camera? The answer is yes, because it has been an old objective to uh, develop uh, 
simple self-calibrating procedures, uh, not requiring calibration charts or photometric measuring devices. And so uh, we did some uh, hypotheses, but uh, it's possible. Uh, in this kind, so images are stored applying an unknown function, F, which is called camera response function, CRF, uh, which can be uh, whatever a function, not, not uh, affine or, or so on. And um, gray levels here depends on that function through the exposure X, which is defined as the product of the illuminance E uh, on the sensor and exposure time delta T. So the only thing that is that uh, F is uh, assumed uh, uh, monotonic. The scene uh, should be static and we assume that um, the complete process of uh, acquisition uh, is um, done uh, rapidly in order to uh, neglect uh, the lighting changes. So you can uh, ignore it. And so from this image sequence, taken at different uh, exposure time durations, and solving again a linear system of equations represented by each pixel's uh, value. We can compute uh, pixel value in each uh, image. Uh, we can compute the uh, characteristic curve called uh, camera response function, as you can see here. The uh, x axis represents uh, uh, exposure or uh, illuminance and the y-axis is the camera response function between uh, here between 0 and 1 or it can be also between 0 and 255 uh, like pixel values. So it's done here for a monochromatic uh, image and it can be done also uh, with a color camera. Thus you have to uh, estimate this function, but for the three channels, uh, R, G, and B, uh, so for each color channel, and it's the same process uh, from uh, many images at many exposures, you solve the linear uh, system and you can have this kind of uh, results. And the goal of this um, um, solution is to construct an HDR image uh, with a unit of uh, illuminance that is in lux. So with this kind of uh, calibration, you do not have luminance because there is no calibrating device, but in illuminance, assuming we know the uh, um, camera response function for the three channels. So this is for the uh, photometric calibration. And so what a transition to speak about color. And this is the uh, third part of my talk is to uh, how uh, can we measure colors. So measuring colors seems easy, very easy, but uh, indeed it is not. It is not because it depends on many parameters. First, uh, it's the illuminance. We call the, the source the illuminance. The scene is illuminated by the sun here or by a light bulb. And you have to know its energy spectrum. It also depends on the object, uh, on object absorption. And finally, it depends also on the observer. If it's a camera, it will depend on its wavelength sensitivity. 
or its response function. And if it's a human A, you need to consider a frame called uh, XYZ frame that you can see here, uh, which has been defined by CIE. CIE, it's uh, commission, it's defined in French, Commission Internationale de l'Eclairage. So in English, uh, International Commission on uh, Lighting. And um, once again, we, we need some uh, knowledge about how camera is measuring colors to, to define all of these steps. So to measure color, a camera is made of a silicium matrix in gray here. This uh, matrix absorbs the photons, uh, visible photons or infrared photons, and transforms them into electrons. Okay, but as electrons are indistinguishable, we cannot know if one electron is born from a red photon or green photon or blue photon. So one way to know it is to know where is born the electron and it's to apply color filters uh, on the silicium matrix. And these uh, filters, uh, it's called a Bayer RGB pattern, like that. Thus, the raw image does not record the red values at all pixels location and an interpolation here, uh, algorithm called the mosaic process is used to compute the three complete RGB layers here. So uh, we need some uh, interpolation and the spectral sensibilities uh, of the filters can be measured one possibility we, uh, with a monochromator and in a, in a special lab, but uh, more simply it's uh, given by the manufacturer uh, in the data sheet of the color camera. So you can have spectral sensitivity in the data sheet and it, if um, the observer is a human eye, uh, you need again the CIE because as colors are a construction of the brain, that is of the uh, human visual uh, system, the CIE has defined a standard frame XYZ and the linear combination of three spectral function can uh, produce a signal which may uh, visually match to any color. So these spectral functions are called matching functions and are used to define the CIE uh, X uh, in capital letters XYZ frame and from these uh, coordinates we can define a two-dimensional colorimetric frame. This is it. We, uh, the definition are here from the uh, capital letters X, Y and Z and this two-dimensional uh, colorimetric frame where uh, X and Y in, here in uh, lower case are sufficient to describe uh, every uh, visible color. Here we have um, a D65 point. It represents a reference white point under the D65 illuminant and D65 illuminant is a, a daylight condition also defined by CIE. So on one hand, the camera is recording RGB coordinates. On the other hand, your eye is recording XYZ coordinates and the colorimetric calibration, uh, calibration sorry, consists in finding the function that permits to uh, map from one frame to the other. So again, some mathematics. Uh, another um, useful frame in colorimetry is a CIE LAB frame, which takes into account that all perception or human perception is non-uniform with respect to you, to uh, 
color. So this system uh, has been defined by CIE in 1966, 76, where uh, L star, but star is often omitted. So L stands for luminosity, that is a vertical axis in the picture, and A and B represent a color axis, so the horizontal plane. Um, yes, it, it exists a, a passage a matrix from XYZ to LAB or vice versa, so uh, we can decide to calibrate our uh, RGB camera with respect to XYZ or LAB frame, it, it does not matter. So, uh, this is uh, uh, done for the theoretical um, um, expressions. Now we can do it in practice again. To calibrate in practice, the most accurate way is to uh, control illuminant. How to do that? We can buy uh, special uh, LEDs here. Uh, reproducing the skylight, uh, you can see on the right picture, so in blue, it is a theoretical CIE D65 uh, spectrum, and in red, it's the LED uh, spectrum, where we can see here a blue peak, uh, which is uh, typical of white uh, LEDs. So, um, these LEDs are uh, sold in the bar form, yeah, and uh, we can put it in a white box, uh, as uh, shown here, uh, to have a good lighting uniformity. Uh, exactly uh, as for the plant, it's, it's the same thing for uh, measuring color. Um, a second tool very useful is uh, um, a color shaker. It is almost uh, unavoidable to calibrate. Each colored patch here is uh, completely known. Uh, their spectral reflectivities are given and also their uh, XYZ coordinates or LAB coordinates are given with regard to uh, the illuminant. And uh, from this uh, color shaker coordinates, you can uh, calibrate uh, your camera. Uh, if you want uh, more uh, to be more accurate, you can also invest in, uh, uh, I, I said invest, so yes, the investment of, the, of that tool is not so much, it costs about 80 euros and um, I do recommend it if uh, you want to, to enter in uh, colorimetry with cameras. It's a good, a good investment. But if you want to be more accurate, um, you can uh, also measure the, uh, your experimental setup and the colorimetric coordinates of the color shaker with the use of a colorimeter. But uh, you have to be uh, more rich because richer because it's it's quite expensive uh, a tool like that it's about some thousands of euros so it's, it's quite yes expensive so how do we do to calibrate uh, again some mathematics the calibration requires uh, to solve a linear system um, because you have the x y z values uh, in one side, your images and your RGB values, and you have to uh, to guess this T matrix, and this final matrix uh, is characteristic of your uh, sensor and permits to measure uh, to have your uh, recording images in X Y Z frame or L E B frame. Um, yeah, in practice, so we uh, put the color checker in our box, we register one, we record one uh, image, and we, um, um, how do we, um, we extract uh, from the image each uh, patch RGB values here, so 
24 values and uh, a triplet each time. We know theoretically their LAB values, or they can be measured with a colorimeter also. And so solving this uh, system corresponds to determine the C values and so to the colorimetric color, uh, calibration. And again, as uh, the reprojected errors uh, in uh, geometric calibration, we can compare the predicted values uh, in uh, y axis with the known values in x axis. And also, we can use a comparison metric dedicated to color, and it is called delta E. It's uh, uh, an Euclidean distance of uh, between two colors in LAB frame. And so uh, delta E value lower than three uh, here. Uh, so lower than three is not seen by the human eye. So here we can observe then that uh, the, the black uh, patch has bigger error probably due to its very low uh, luminance value. And one, see, one can see here that this particular blue is also difficult to predict with a, a standard uh, LGB system. So um, to finish, uh, there is also some apps for your smartphone. There is colorimeter or camera colorimeter for more than one dollar and um, there is a very very well uh, commercial uh, talk here but i i'm very curious about their results and i'm very um, skeptic skeptical about their uh, uncertainties because uh, it greatly depends on your smartphone and your element so uh, I, I don't know if it's really uh, um, accurate but uh, i'm curious to 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 compare the result uh, with a, a color shaker and so yeah i finished with a colorimetric calibration we've seen uh, photometric and geometric and so uh, from its finish it's yes i'm a little bit early five minutes so quite good and if you have some question about uh, all the the thing I've talked. Uh, be free to to ask me some uh, questions. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Vincent. Thank you very much for the.